welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Caroline Strawson and I'm a trauma-informed therapist and coach, really on a mission to help you heal narcissistic abuse through a trauma-informed lens. Now, my episode today was with an interview with Professor Sam Vaknin. Now, Sam is author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. And we had, well, really a nearly a two hour interview. What was scheduled as maybe 45 minutes just went on. And we had just the best conversation and it was really, really interesting. And we recorded the whole lot for you. So you're gonna see the sort of live, raw, unedited version of all of this, because then you can see the questions that I was asking Sam, some of the comments that he was making and a lot of the stuff in the line of work that I do, I completely agree with him. However, there were some things that I challenged him on um, because I approach everything very much through that trauma informed lens. So rather than um, really looking at the pathology of things, which I know Sam really agrees with me um, as well, we were looking at some other elements. Now, I will warn you, there will be some trigger warnings through all of this, particularly towards the end of the interview. We talked a lot about being a victim and victimhood. And that was probably the one thing that I perhaps disagreed with Sam about, about maybe our approach to how we perceive people who have been victimized by narcissists. It was just a fascinating interview and I hope you really, really enjoy it. I'd love to know what your comments are around this. Um, Sam even gave me a compliment and said I asked some really, really good questions because I literally felt like as I was talking to him, I thought, oh yeah, I'd love to know this. What are your thoughts on that? Because obviously I work with those who are victimized by narcissistic abuse. And Sam was actually the first person to co coin the phrase narcissistic abuse recovery. So it was really fascinating with all of his decades of work and academia around this, and also his own personal experience of how we could really talk and really try and shift people of how they perceive narcissism, narcissistic personality disorder. Both of us are in a lot of agreement around the DSM and the pathologizing of all of this and, and almost dehumanization of it. So it was a really interesting interview. I hope you really enjoy it. We've said we'll have a follow-up one as well. So it is almost two hours long. So maybe go and grab yourself a, a coffee or a cuppa or something so you can sit and watch all of this or maybe watch it in chunks. It's entirely up to you, but I hope you really enjoy it. And please, any comments or questions or anything maybe next time I interview Sam, you'd maybe like me to ask him as well, then I would love to share that with you. But I hope you can see you know, my, my real passion for you watching this is to know that A, there is hope. Secondly, you're not on your own. I believe you. And I've been exactly where you are now. And equally that how you feel right now isn't your fault. This is your nervous system responding to your perceived threat of danger. So enjoy the interview. Let me know any feedback. And um, I have to say a big thank you and lots of gratitude to Sam for allowing me to spend that time with him to interview him, quiz him, challenge him, asking all of those questions. So enjoy the interview and I'll catch up with you in the next episode on my YouTube channel. But please, again, if you haven't hit like and subscribe, please do so. Hit the bell because then you will get all of the next episodes jumping into your inbox as well. So enjoy. No, a lot of people will want to know, certainly from my audience, is where this passion comes for you to talk about narcissism and personality disorders. You know, where does this come from? Because I know this is really what, what you focus on and you have this real passion. Right. I've been doing this for 26 years. Um, I've seen on your website that you are a narcissistic abuse coach. Correct. And narcissistic abuse is a phrase that I coined in I 1995. Yeah. And, and I thought when, when we were having that conversation about all of that, I, I mean, it, it, it's and this is why I'm really interested, obviously, in talking to you, because we use this word now very fluidly in our society, um, yeah. sometimes correctly, very often incorrectly as well. And I think, again, the approach I come is very from a trauma informed perspective. Um, in all of this. That's why I'm really interested in talking to you around this, because 26 years is a long time to be studying this. Yes, indeed. I, I, um, when, I, when I started the whole thing in 95, there was nothing online. I, I maintained the first website and the first six support groups for victims. 
and that that had lasted for nine years. I was all alone for nine years. There was absolutely no one else. I had, but more importantly, I had to invent the entire language or most most of the language that is in use today because there were no words. There were no words to describe what was happening. And you know, in the absence of words, there's no consciousness. Words create consciousness. People were grappling in the dark, trying to trying to convey and communicate why their experiences are idiosyncratic, why their experiences are unique. They're not like typical abuse. Something else is happening and they lack the words. So I rummaged through psychoanalytic literature and I picked up phrases like for sale from Winnicott. I picked up narcissistic supply from Fenico, but I was still short. I was still short of many words. So I had to come up with my own words. So for example, devalue and discard or somatic narcissist or cerebral narcissist or narcissistic abuse itself or hoovering or flying monkeys we need or narcissistic We always need a, a narcissistic dictionary, don't we? In all yes, we do. We do because the experience of narcissistic abuse is like nothing else. Yeah. I'm a professor of psychology. I teach personality disorders in general, and I teach trauma. Um, I teach neuroscience of trauma and psychology of trauma. And I can tell you um, that there is nothing which comes close to narcissistic abuse. And if you're interested, I will I will elucidate why. But. I, I would love to hear more about that because I think what you highlight is something that even when there was nothing out there about this, and even though now there is stuff there about this, there is this complete lack of understanding of how someone feels when they are going through narcissistic abuse, narcissistic trauma. And, and, it, and I just think those people you were working with over those nine years, for instance, you know, they had nothing. And nothing. what they must have been going, I mean, you know, it's hard enough nowadays anyway, but back then as well. Horrible. Absolutely horrible. Was, Within the first year, Within the first year of my presence online, I've, I've written my book in 95, then I placed it online free of charge. And then in 90, by 97, that's one and a half years later, I've had 250,000 members in support groups. That's when there was no internet. I mean, there was literally no internet. I understood the extent, the enormous extent of distress. And even to this very day, in my view, narcissistic abuse, perhaps like most human experiences, is non-communicable in its essence. And what's amazing about narcissistic abuse is each experience is unique, is tailor-made, is customized. Typical abuse, because abuse is a topic that's been in the headlines for 80 years at least. First cases of abuse had been had been described by Freud himself in the in the you know 100 years ago, 110 years ago. But abuse tend to be a cookie cookie cutter phenomenon. All abusers are molded, you know, they, they use the mold. It's, it's, they're all the same. Narcissists tailor the abuse. They don't only tailor the abuse, but narcissistic abuse is what I call total abuse. Total abuse means that the narcissist targets every dimension, every vector, every aspect of everything, your personality, your life, your friendships, your family, your past history, your confidence, confidences, your information that he leverages against you, legal aspects, financial aspects, the children, commu community property, I mean, you name it. Narcissistic abuse is, like the disorder itself, all pervasive. Yeah, so why do you think that happens? Why do you think then narcissistic abuse is so different then to other types of abuse. So like you say, it's almost like, you know, other abusers, so to speak, you know, from a sort of trauma informed perspective, we can kind of look at, like you say, this cookie cutter approach of how it happens, why they're doing it, what happens with the victims, etc. Why is it so different then with narcissists? Because narcissists as opposed to typical abusers don't regard what they're doing as abuse. Here's the thing, the narcissist relates to his intimate partner, not as an external object, but as an internal object. He snapshots, he takes a snapshot of the partner and then he photoshops the snapshot 
And this process is called idealization. So he refers from the first minute, actually, he begins to refer to an idealized internal object within his mind. And this internal object in his mind starts interacting with other internal objects in his mind, preceding, preceding his intimate partner, his mother, his father, peers, influential figures, and so on. And so the narcissist lives inside his mind and he manipulates the internal objects and he coerces them into dialogues and interactions and so on. And you are not an external object. So he does not perceive as, as he does not perceive anything he does as abusive. Mm. He, perceive it, he perceives it as a mode of communication or a mode of control or a mode of securing making sure that there will be no ultimate abandonment. Narcissists have abandonment anxiety. And that's so interesting, Sam, because I think, you know, what a, a, a lot of what I talk about, and I think this is kind of what you're saying as well, is that intention versus impact. You know, the intention of a narcissist isn't necessarily to abuse their victim, so to speak. It's like you say, it's all about within. It's about, you know, not feeling abandoned, not feeling worthless, but mm -hmm. the impact of that intention then is mm -hmm. it becomes abusive to the person that they are perpetuating that to. That's very true. And in this sense, of course, the narcissist is distinct, distinct from other personality disorders. For example, the borderline, when she, um, when she anticipates abandonment or rejection or humiliation, let alone when she is actually rejected or humiliated or abandoned, the, the borderline switches into a mode of behavior, which is essentially secondary psychopathy, uh, not primary psychopathy, secondary psychopathy. A secondary psychopathy is a psychopath who has empathy and emotions. So she becomes a secondary psychopath, but and she dissociates, of course, what she's doing, but she is intentional. She wants to inflict harm. She wants to punish. She wants revenge. She wants restoration of a sense of, of justice and equilibrium. She is goal-oriented. The psychopath is the same. The psychopath is goal-oriented. So is the paranoid. So is the schizoid. The only, the only personality disorder of all 12 the only personality disorder wh which is not goal-oriented in the sense that the narcissist is not hell-bent on inflicting abuse, nor, nor does he sadistically enjoy his actions, contrary to myths online. Yeah? So the narcissist is so focused on his needs, on, 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 for example, the need to avoid abandonment, the need to regulate his sense of self-worth, the need to, to forestall uh, depression or mood lability, etc. He's so focused on his needs that you are collateral damage. The intimate partner is just a byproduct. What's done to the intimate partner is a side effect. And the intimate partner is collateral damage. The narcissist has to, in, the narcissist invests all his energy, all his mental resources in maintaining the precarious house of cards, which is a narcissistic personality, he has nothing left to give you. He's depleted, he's depleted from the first minute he gets out of bed. He's utterly depleted, he's a, in a state of constant, unmitigated exhaustion, and he has nothing left to give you. And so if you make demands, for instance, or have expectations, then you are threatening this balance, this equilibrium, that he had worked so hard to maintain, and you become a threat, you become a menace. So from a trauma-informed perspective then, that threat, that danger then, obviously dysregulates their nervous system and they're going to react accordingly. They're, they're, they of course have, have a flight or fight reaction actually to you. When similarly, when you display autonomy, personal autonomy, when you show your independence, mm. this is a threat because it, it, it heralds, it, it's a harbinger of ultimate abandonment. The narcissist interprets your independence and autonomy as a signal, I'm about to abandon you. I'm about to go away. Moreover, when you are, when you are being you, simply you, not ostentatiously, not conspicuously, just being you, 
you diverge and deviate from the internal object, from the snapshot. These divergences between you and your representation, your inner representation in the narcissist's mind, these divergences create what we call dissonance. And the dissonance creates anxiety. So any display of autonomy or independence or even mere existence, any reminder that you exist outside his mind provokes in the narcissist enormous anxiety. And he needs to ameliorate and control this anxiety by reducing you into an object, yeah. and into a mummy, mummifying you. Yeah, so hence when the isolation comes into play, they almost want to isolate you. So you need them. And that obviously then calms their system with all of that. Yeah. So what makes them the, so when we think about all the other personality disorders in this then, Sam, what makes the narcissist then so different? Why is the narcissist so different then from the other personality disorders? I like your questions. Now to the point and the highlight important issues, I think. Yeah. Uh, the difference between, I never give compliments. It's oh, just a, it's a, just a commentary, a commentary on the interview. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to take that for a moment and let that sit. Right. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, 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 um, the, difference, the difference between the narcissist and other personality disorders, perhaps with the exception of the borderline. Because Kernberg, for example, Otto Kernberg believed, had believed uh, in, in the 70s that narcissism and borderline are actually indistinguishable um, disorders on a spectrum, but indistinguishable. And both of them are on the verge of psychosis. And that's why he called it borderline. It's on the border between neurosis and psychosis. But narcissists and borderlines are the only ones with what we call a schizoid empty core. So in the 1960s, there was a school of thought in psychology. It was called the British, the British Object Relations School. And we had Fairbairn, we had Guntrip, we had Winnicott, we, and much, much later we had Seinfeld and so on. And they were the British school. And what they had said is that the, 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 there's an emptiness where a, where a human being should have been. There's an emptiness where a person should have been. And this is the empty core of the narcissist and the borderline. And I will not go right now into the reasons why this empty core forms. It has to do with, with not good enough parenting yeah. or wrong upbringing or exactly. what, what Andre Green called a dead mother. Andre Green described a dead mother. That's a mother who is absent, selfish, um, parentifies the child, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And so these children do not form a self. They have no self. Uh, Jung called this process constellation. So these children don't have a constellated self. Moreover, and that's the irony, narcissists don't have an ego. Narcissists are egoless not egotists, <laughs> they're egoless. They don't have an ego. And there, is, there are two reasons why they don't have an ego. First of all, they're isolated from reality. Many narcissists are pampered and smothered and spoiled and put on a pedestal. And Um, that they don't have object relations. In other words, narcissists and borderlines and so on didn't go through the phases of interacting with other people other than mummy, other than oneself. So in the absence of friction with reality and in the absence of friction with other people, the, this lack of input rendered the narcissist and the borderline selfless, mm. in, ironically, or egoless. And so what they need to do, they need you to serve as an intimate partner. They need you to serve as a surrogate self, as a substitute ego, and, and as a good enough mother. These are your roles. Your roles are to regulate the ego functions of the narcissist. Your role is to serve as an external memory of the narcissist because the narcissist is dissociative. Can, his memory is short. He's discontinuous. He needs you to maintain the continuity. And above all, he needs you to act as a good enough mother so that he finally can experience proper parenting or proper mothering. 
and he pushes you, he coerces you, he co-opts you, he manipulates you into these positions. And if for some reason you refuse, you bolt, you push back, you become the enemy. This is not about, this is not about adulating him, adul adulating him only. Actually, the narcissist wants you to admire him as a mother would. He wants you to look at him, he wants you to, to give him the gaze of a mother. Now, of course, every mother admires her son or daughter, admires her kid. He's a kid. And he wants you to love him and admire him as a mother would unconditionally. So he tests you. He tests, he wants to make sure that you are a good mother. So he misbehaves. Like a toddler, would, like a toddler would to try and- Like a toddler would, yeah. Testing those, back. I mean, I do a lot of internal family systems in the work I do. So what you're talking about there, again, it, it just reinforces that, that, that lack of self. And then the protector parts are coming up to try and distract, soothe, numb out, like dissociating from feeling the pain of that lack of self. And, and again, that can come out from the victims of narcissistic abuse. That can also come out in many different formats. The same for a narcissist. But actually the ultimate, just as you were saying in all of that, is that lack of self, that danger of, of that core wound, not wanting to feel like that and desperately then looking to soothe that wound, that lack of self. Yes, you've mentioned internal family system where the self plays a very critical role. Um, it's a problem to apply uh, internal family system to narcissists precisely because they, they they don't have a dysfunctional self they don't have a self it's like a they've got a false self in some respects yes, the false self, but the false self is not a self it, it's yeah. a very unfortunate yeah. phrase yeah. coined yeah. by donald by donald winnicott yeah. it's it's not a self yeah. it's not a self in any sense by the way for example the false self is yeah. the opposite of the ego yes. the ego the ego's main role is reality yeah. testing the main role of the ego is to get you in touch with reality so that you have feedback yeah. that tells you which actions you should avoid and which actions are proper. That's the main role of the ego. The false self does exactly the opposite. Correct. Removes you from reality, isolates you from, and falsifies reality for you. Creates, in other words, a fantastic space. The false self is a fantasy defense writ large. It has nothing to do with the self or with the ego. So it's I a very think, unfortunate phrase. I think what you highlight there is how things then do get misinterpreted. So again, from that internal family systems, I suppose people use that language because they're trying to help other people then gain a sense of understanding. But actually from an academic perspective, like we say, it, it's incorrect. But do we say that then because it makes the victims feel better about it? Or, or are we doing disservice then? Because actually it's not the actual facts of the situation. So again, from the internal family systems, the protector part, so to speak, become how the narcissist will live their life, just the same as other people will then live their life. And I suppose that term false sense of self, you know, is that we create these things to try and make people feel, feel better. And I think, again, I mean, we could talk for so long about all of this, Sam, is are we using language incorrectly and are we even from the term of medicalizing narcissistic personality disorder and all these other disorders, are we doing a disservice in doing that as well? Because are we actually then looking at root cause, trauma and, and all of that elements? You know, that doesn't mean it excuses behavior, but it gives an explanation. So is the DSM there then to explain, to excuse or to give us a semblance of understanding, but actually, is that the reality of the understanding of all of this? No, I, I hold a very dim view of uh, most of the texts that pertain to narcissism, starting, of course, with the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is still very categorical. Yeah. So it's a list of lists. Correct. And, and, it's I, a list of lists. and I'd love you to talk more about that because I feel exactly the same. I feel like it's a way of professionals to diagnose something as a symptomatic of something as opposed to root cause and then supporting people on you know maybe no, the, the etiology the etiology is totally missing in the dsm correct the dsm is uh, symptom symptomatology yeah. and uh, behavior behavioral um, observations but etiology is missing dynamics is missing it's yeah. totally non-dynamic 
It's a static book. They're trying now with the alternative models. Yes. They have alternative models. They're trying at the, at, the, at the very end, page 767. They're trying somehow. Yeah, but, I've seen that being brought in a bit more with, with narcissism as well, you know, bringing in more of that covert element and, you yeah, know, the yeah, like element of Overt that. Mood, mood dysregulation. Yeah, yeah, as opposed to just the nine traits and everything. Yeah. So I, I, I'm holding a very, uh, very dim view. Language breaks down. How do you, how do you describe a non-entity? Yes. Language breaks down. Our language, language is predicated on existence. Mm. We, we deal with objects, we deal with people, we deal with entities, it's entity-based. Language breaks down, and, and I find it very useful to borrow from Zen Buddhism, or from when I, when I try to, to relate to narcissism. Now, of course, if you look at internal family system, then the false self has rescuer functions and protective functions. But when you look at transactional analysis, yeah. the, there's the child, there's the adult, yeah. And, and so, so, of course, you can borrow met metaphors yeah. from a variety of, you know, this discipline, discipline approaches. Yeah. Or, but these are metaphors. That's the problem. It's one step removed. Yeah. It's not the essence. It's an allegory. Yeah. And allegories can only, only go so far. I can talk to you now about psychopathy and I'll be touching the essence of the psychopath. I'll be touching his, his real core. I'll be touching him. I can talk to you about borderline and I'll be touching her. I'll be really, really, really talking about her, describing her. And I've posted a series of videos about borderline. borderline and in the comments, uh, women mostly, border, uh, diagnosed with borderline personality disorders, they say, yes, you're describing me. Yes, that's me. Yeah. Because I can touch the core. Because that's the essence. It's extremely difficult to do with narcissists. How do you how do you discuss meaningfully emptiness? What is the sound of one hand clapping in the forest? Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a Great huge problem. That. Language breaks down simply. Um, so do you think then that in an ideal world? we shouldn't have the DSM, we shouldn't diagnose, we should look at more root cause. And do you think then from a narcissism perspective then, because it, again, it, it's a word we hear m much, much more now. I know social media obviously holds um, one of those reasons, but do you think as well, there are more narcissists in the world now than there were 20 years ago, 40 years ago, a hundred years ago, or do you think it, it is, always been there and the same roughly amount of people in the world or do you actually think that it is becoming more prevalent now and why if so well first of all there are alternatives to the dsm for example i strongly recommend the pdm which is the psychodynamic diagnostic manual pdm is very deep it includes the dynamic aspects it includes etiologies and so on. Regrettably, it is limited to one way of looking at psychology, which is the psychodynamic psychotherapist. Yeah. So that's regrettable, but it's far preferable to the DSM. Had I, if I had my way, which would have pleased me no end, <laughs> what I would have done, I would have created a diagnostic man, man, manual based on literature. So when, if I wanted, if I wanted to describe psychosis, I would have borrowed writings from Dostoevsky. If I wanted to describe um, a certain types of narcissists, I would have I would have borrowed Bazukov from War and Peace, Tolstoy's War and Peace. I would have compiled the diagnostic manual entirely borrowing from works of literature, because no one had better insight, more penetrating insight, than than authors of fiction, good authors of fiction. No one, no one can comes close to these. Um, and of course, Freud was was much more an author than a psychologist. Do you, do you think that's because they have more of a skill of using word to explain as opposed to maybe other people who aren't approaching it necessarily from the perspective of the reader, the understanding, they're approaching it from a different dynamic? I think there are two reasons, actually. First of all, rightly noted, the writing, words, language mm -hmm. is the skill of authors, not the skill of psych psychologists. And the barrier of language is insurmountable because psychology is a form of literature. It's not a science, it can never be a science. 
and as a form of literature, it's very lacking. The texts, the texts are badly written. The texts do not convey too many things. They're, they are, so there are lacunas and deficiencies in the texts, in the, in the scriptures of psychology, because it's a, it's a bit religious, <laughs> it's a bit of a religion. That's the first thing. The second thing is psychology has an aspiration to science. Psychology is a wannabe science. Yeah. And all psychologists pretend that they are physicists, which I am, by the way, I have a doctorate in physics. So all psychologists pretend that they are physicists. Yeah. And so they take this position, I'm just observing. I'm an observer. I'm cool headed. I'm analytical. I collect numbers and then I analyze them statistically. And that puts me on par, on par with physicists and mathematicians because I use statistics. This Cartesian detachment there is the patient and there is me, and I have nothing in common with the patient. I'm just observing him as I would observe an insect, a curious insect. This detachment is a hindrance. It's an obstacle. And it does not exist in the writings of Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky identified with his characters. He penetrated them via insight and via identification. He became them. And the only psychologist that comes to mind who had attempted this is R.D. Lane, L-A-I-N-G. Yes, this is the only, only one. And maybe Carl Rogers, maybe Carl Rogers with humanistic psychology. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're the only ones, I think. Who, and all the others were playing at being scientists, so pseudo-scientists. So when we talk about that, because obviously, if you think about those, then on the whole, as a society in general, you know, I know we've obviously got psychiatrists as well, but from a psychology perspective, then from a diagnosis, you know, those then that are victims of a narcissist and those who are a narcissist, how do we move forward in a society then? How do we support those who've been you know, words we use abused by a narcissist, but then the narcissist doesn't necessarily think it's abuse, going back to the intention and impact again. So how do we do that? Do we look for diagnosis? Do we look for um, a different way of looking at those who've been involved with a narcissist? Do we look more at trying to support a narcissist through all of this? Because again, you know, I've never seen any research, certainly from my perspective, where I've seen a narcissist has been diagnosed with NPD to then go on and leave, lead a really flourishing life with really deep, meaningful relationships. I've not read anything about that. I know there are things out there for improvement, et cetera, et cetera, but I haven't well, necessarily seen anything you know and, and you'll laugh at this Sam I had I remember having a big debate with somebody a while ago actually a lady who was a um, prison officer and she was saying we've been working with lots of narcissists in the prison and we can heal them you know we, we're, we're curing them we're really helping them and everything and I said can you just tell me then what is the consequence of them looking like and perceiving that there is improvement well, they can get released early. And she couldn't get her head around then <laughs> that actually, could it possibly be that they're so manipulative that they can see the consequences of therapy with you to get yeah. the result that they want? And, and I think as a society, we want to think of people to be able to be healed and get better and cure and everything else. And I think that probably lies in the problem in some respects. So, you know, if we're looking at the victim and the narcissist themselves, how do we collaborate this in our society today so that when someone says, I'm dealing with a narcissist, people don't get the eye rolling, no one believes you, etc. And that actually makes a victim feel even worse and devalued. But equally then an understanding from a narcissist perspective, not to excuse behavior, but to give a level of explanation. Generally, there's a medicalization and labeling of the human condition. Yeah. We have isolated traits and behaviors. We have amalgamated them into syndromes and we label them and then we medicalize them. Yeah. And this tendency is regrettable, it's yeah. counterproductive because it puts people in boxes yeah. and because it, it tempers with their minds and we don't know enough about the mind. Yeah. We don't know enough about the mind, let alone about the brain. We know close to nothing. 
And so this is, this is narcissistic grandiosity, actually, on the part of professionals. That's one, one commentary. You asked me if there are many more narcissists than used to be. I don't think so. I think there's a growing awareness. Yeah. I think there is economic incentive to identify people as narcissists, both by professionals and by the cottage industry that had sprung around narcissists, narcissism, narcissistic abuse, and so on. No offense, man. And so, <laughs> so there's an economic incentive, of course, to aggrandize the problem or, or shed light mm -hmm. upon it or put it in the limelight. Or, it's, and I don't think, um, I don't think it's the 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 core clinical entity is any different than it had been, let's say, two thousand or five thousand years ago. What I do think is happening is that people don't realize that narcissism is a positive adaptation. Pathological narcissism had allowed the child to survive yeah. in very adverse circumstances, allowed the child to emerge as a relatively functioning individual. And so the child is very, the child turned adult is very unlikely to give up on this positive adaptation because it had kept him alive. He's emotionally attached. He's cathected, cathected. He's emotionally invested yeah. in his, in That's his nice. condition. Other people life. regard it, other people regard it as a disorder. He doesn't. Yeah. He regards it as an evolutionary advantage and a personal adaptation, which was very positive. Hence why we don't get many diagnoses, because a diagnosis yeah. comes from someone saying, hey, I think I have a problem. I'm going to yeah. go get a diagnosis. And of course, like just yeah. as you highlight, if they don't think they have a problem, why would they go and seek a diagnosis? It's, it's much worse. Yeah. It's not that they don't think they have a problem. It's they think they have an advantage. Yeah, yeah. They perceive their narcissism as the next step in the evolutionary ladder. Yeah. Narcissism made them resilient and strong and survivors. And here's the, here's, here's the breakdown in communication between victims and narcissists. Narcissists are abuse victims. Yes. They're victims of abuse. Right, I agree. Yeah. They're victims of abuse who had chosen, settled upon a specific solution. Yeah. Yeah. Others have settled upon codependency. Others have settled upon borderline. Others have settled upon. Analogy. I love that analogy. I just think, you know, I hope the listeners take that in. It's a, you know, from a codependence, borderline, narcissism, it's an adaptation to protect ourselves from feeling pain. Yeah. yeah, it is. And victims of abuse should understand that we are all in the victim community. Yes. This is a single victim community. It's not victims against narcissists. It's a single victim community in which some of the victims had adopted abrasive antisocial behaviors. So we need to focus on these behaviors, yeah. not on any alleged disorder or condition. Because recent studies, starting with Judith Herman, who had coined, coined the phrase complex trauma or complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. So she is a bit of an authority on the topic, shall we say. Judith Herman herself says, that there is no distinction between a CPTSD victim, a complex trauma victim, and a narcissist or a borderline. Yeah, which makes and the DSM to, then, just like you say, you could almost look at the DSM and go, yeah, complex PTSD. Yes, so today, today there's a big drive and probably it's gonna happen. Yeah. There's a big drive to amalgamate um, and to convert borderline personality disorder into a post-traumatic condition. And there's a similar drive going on, for example, in Australia and so on, the drive that I must say I initiated 25 years ago to reconceive of personality disorders, especially cluster B, as post-traumatic conditions. Yeah. And the minute we do this, victims can develop inner peace. Yeah. So... The, on that then, because I know people will be listening to this thinking, oh, you're, you're giving a lot of airtime to the narcissist here. We're almost starting to feel sorry for the narcissist, but look at what they did to me. Look at what they do to other people. So almost in response to that then, how do we then amalgamate, just as you were saying, that knowledge of knowing it, it's abusive with behaviours, but 
also trying to gain a level of understanding without almost denigrating and devaluing the experience of somebody who has been the victim of narcissistic abuse? First of all, it's politically incorrect to say, but studies by Judith Herman and many others have led to the conclusion that victims of abuse become abusers. Yeah. Actually, the vast majority, well over 80% of victims of abuse engage in narcissistic and psychopathic behaviors, including defiance, impulsivity, reckless behavior, promiscuity, yeah. substance abuse, etc., etc. Yeah, yeah. In other words, it's a fluid state. Yeah. You can start off as a victim and end as an abuser, and you can start off as an abuser and end as a victim. And you can start off as a victim, as a child, and end up being an adult abuser. Yeah. And you, so it's wrong to demarcate and delineate. Yeah. There is no dividing line. There is fluidity between personality disorders as well, which is why the next edition of the International Classification of Diseases, edition 11, eliminates personality disorders altogether. And it is a single diagnosis personality disorder so so it's, an it's actual, fluid. so it's almost then it's the adaptation of behavior in response to trauma we should focus we should focus not on the self-aggrandizing distinction between so-called empaths yeah many of whom are actually covert narcissists and narcissists and psychopaths and i don't know what Every narcissist has a psychopathic phase. Every psychopath becomes narcissistic. Every borderline becomes psychopathic. Every borderline becomes narcissistic. All they are all intermeshed. It's a single disorder. Yeah. And here's the breaking news. Every victim becomes narcissist. Every victim becomes psychopath. Every victim becomes borderline at given times. It's all, it's a river. We all flow into each other. So it's not an accident. It, it's not a coincidence that narcissists end up with victims. Yeah. You, you could ask yourself, why are there victims to start with? Correct. There are victims because of this resonance. So how do we in a society then bring some resolution to that? if we're looking to move forward, because we can have all these explanations, we can change, you know, the list of personality disorders down to one, we can gain this understanding, but as a world, as human beings then, how do we find resolution in this? Where do we focus? What do we do? How do we support people who have been through this? And also then, at what point then do we devote the time then to the, abusers in that moment because i get we can move from victim to abuser to a victim where do we draw the line with all of that and where do we as a society then you know spend the time and and the support in all of this how do we do that what do you think i think i think we should focus on self-defense we should focus on teaching people how to develop and enforce boundaries how to, how to, we should be much more how to oriented. We are unfortunately too focused on diagnosis, demonizing, yeah. demonizing. We are too, foc too focused on denial and splitting. The narcissist is all bad, I'm an angel. It's, that's splitting, it's, it's a that splitting not, defense. And that's a childlike way of viewing things, you yes. know, devil, angel. It's not, there's and a it's whole a, it's a, in the and middle. It's a splitting defense. Yeah. It's a defense typical of narcissists. In borderlines. Yeah, because it's a childlike behavior going back it's to... It's infantile. Childhood. It's infantile. Yeah. And many victims engage in this defense and don't realize that just by using this defense, they're actually narcissists <laughs> and borderlines. So we should get rid of all this. We should focus on self-defense, boundaries, proper behavior, reactivity, how to react. We should educate survival because many victims will never abandon their narcissist. We have to finally accept this. Yeah, that bonding, that, that addiction to the... Yes, it's yeah. trauma bonding. Yeah. And, and here's the thing. The victim is a child. And the narcissist is a child. <laughs> and they share the same childhood. Yeah. They emanate. They have a common source. They have a common fountain. 
they, they just found well, a different way of adapting from a codependent to a narcissist. They are two children and yeah. they shared the same horrendous childhood. So, and they, 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 their inner children bond and bind and, and attach. It's the inner children that attach, yeah. not the adults. There's, there are no adults there in most cases. So we should give up on this notion that, you know, and we should begin to teach people survival strategies within such relationships because they're never going to give, give up and then you, never going to leave. So do you think it's possible then, because I get asked this question a lot, you know, is there any way I can stay in this relationship with a narcissist and it be a really loving, deeply connected relationship? Um, you know, is there any way then, if we're talking, say, narcissist codependent, let's just use that analogy to start off with. Is there any way for a narcissist and a codependent to actually have a fully functional relationship together within the parameters then of past trauma? Narcissists and codependents are an easy case because their psychological needs um, correspond. They, they cater to each other's psychological needs. The main need of the codependent is to regulate her internal environment via an external agent, via an intimate partner. It's the same with the borderline. Yeah. Same with the borderline. So these are easy matches. Uh -huh. The problem starts when there's a mentally healthy person, not a codependent, not a borderline, a mentally healthy person and a narcissist. That's where the problem starts. Codependents and borderlines are happy, gratified when they're in a relationship with the narcissist. That's precisely the problem. Do you not think that's their version of happiness? And I get to them, it might seem happy, but when we say, okay, well, if a codependent is getting that secondary gain, and I get that from being in a relationship with a narcissist, like you say, they're, they're like magnets, they're feeding that external need within both of them. But where, but again, then, are we saying then that, a codependent and a narcissist can live happily ever after in this relationship. Because that that doesn't strike me as being so. You know, I, I certainly know that I was a codependent, and and when I look at say the relationships I had, you know, both from a partner and even a, and a friendship perspective. Yes, in some way it was serving me, so to speak, equally with them. But I still think I realised it was toxic on some level it's absolutely toxic and you know, pathological. less so with my friends no it's healthy yeah less so with my friendships i think it took me longer to recognize that element within a friendship capacity and even when i was say with my ex-husband like this you know i realized things weren't right for many many years but i didn't leave i still stayed i still stayed yeah i still if you said were you happy then in that those years i'd have said no I recognized that something wasn't right, but it felt more dangerous to leave to my system than to stay. This, this raises a very interesting topic in the philosophy of psychology. Until the 1960s, perhaps 80s, depends. We had this, this concept of normal. Normal versus abnormal. Mm -hmm. Healthy versus pathological. Yeah. Good for you versus toxic. Yeah. We no longer have these. What we have instead are two questions. Are you happy? Yeah. Are you egocentric in your condition, in your situation, in your circumstances? And the second question we have, are you functional? Do you function properly in a variety of settings? Now, if the answer is yes and yes, you could be a psychotic in a cult yeah. and we should not intervene yeah. because you're happy and you're functional. End of story. Correct. Yes. If the answer is no and yes, we should intervene because you should be happy and you should be functional. So many codependents, with many codependents, the answer is yes and yes. I am happy and I am functional. There we should not intervene. Never mind that objectively it's an abnormal state in the statistical sense. Yeah. It's unusual. And never mind that it doesn't allow, for example, for personal growth. So it's growth stunting. Yeah. It's, it's, we can judge it from outside. We can say, well, 
if I had to choose, I would have never chosen this kind of relationship. So do you think that then is, as a society then, we're almost looking at relationships from a narcissistic perspective then, in that we look at relationship, we do this all of the time, and we think, oh, he should leave, or she should leave, how can she be happy? Okay. How, and, and we're almost, our past experiences, our assumptions, our judgments, we are really projecting onto other people well not, not if you're good not if you're a good professional yes correct if you're a good professional you should not bring your prejudices middle class prejudices or whatever you should not bring even but your a society people do that don't they? Yeah, yeah, of course. we see it in the press we see it everywhere where people are making assumptions and judgments and actually you know i i will get people message me and say my friend's in a narcissistic relationship what can i do i say well does she recognize that has she come to you to ask for help well no it's like well let find a way to let her know that you're there as her friend and when and if she is ever ready then you're there but you cannot make someone see something that they don't see in that moment it's a very pertinent point because very often it is society yes. social pressure culture the cultural context expectations by peers and family and friends these create the distress yeah. these create the unhappiness yeah. yeah and these create the dysfunction so for example today we are reconceiving completely of trauma we no longer regard trauma as a clinical entity an objective thing yeah. we can take 10 people expose them to the same set of circumstances or events and only two of them would be traumatized Correct. And eight, eight wouldn't know what you're talking about. Yeah. So trauma is a subjective experience. And we had discovered in many, many studies that trauma is actually a social construct. People are traumatized because they are expected to be traumatized. Yeah. Other people are telling them, wow, that's a really bad experience. Don't you feel bad? Don't you feel horrible? Don't you? And, and then they say, wait a minute. If so many people are saying that I should feel horrible, I'll feel horrible. So trauma is induced. Yeah. It's very and, also, induced. and going back to the beliefs, like you say, you know, you could have two people involved in a car crash. One of them gets PTSD, the other one doesn't. Yes. You know? But if the one who does get PTSD has been living in an environment where they always feel like they're not worthy or they're not good enough as well, and then they're in this situation, I'm powerless again, and it just gets stuck. So like you say, it's very much about our past experiences that are dictating our adult- Past experiences and traits. For example, we discovered the a very strong correlation between the tendency to be traumatized and suggestibility. Yeah. Um, and ability, uh, imagery, ability to conjure imagery, um, and so on. Past experiences, of course. Um, social and cultural mores and so on. it's it, trauma is a totally subjective issue yeah. so if a codependent comes to you as a therapist and tells you i'm unhappy in this relationship i don't feel fulfilled i cannot grow it doesn't allow me my dependence and autonomy in any way shape or form so of course you should help Correct. of course you should help her exit the relationship but there are numerous others who would tell you that they're perfectly happy yeah. and perfectly functional and they live with a-holes they live with jerks. They live with horrible people. Their, inter their, their, their partner is a, a prime abuser, including physical beatings and battering and what have you. And they're happy. They're happy as a lark. And they're, and they're functional. There, we should not intervene. There is country. no objective measure of happiness. Right, because as a society, so many people assume then that they can't be happy. They can't be okay with that. And people, and again, I think that comes down to, I had a conversation with someone about this the other day, you know, our need to feel like um, we need to do something. I had um, something about, um, I got my COVID vaccine the other day. Oh, right. and I, had, I, yeah, I, know, I was lucky, but I had this well-meaning, absolutely this well-meaning. You, you don't look 70. That, well, I know. You're the day I've got, over 50. I've got a no, fantastic I'm virgin. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I had this well-meaning private message that gave me sort of this fear message of the fact if I was going to have a vaccine, I was potentially putting my life in danger and I'd end up dying and leaving my kids without a mum, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I know her intention as such was to, or what she thought was her intention was to warn me, to, to be a nice person, so to speak. 
to me, when I go deeper with this, her intention was not about me. Her intention was what she thought in that moment was the right thing to say for herself. It wasn't about me. Because if she'd actually have thought about me in that situation, nobody would send a message like that to another mum to try and make them really fearful about a decision I took, you know, a while to make myself. So again, I think we come back to that intention and impact. I think as a society, most people's intentions are very good. They're very pure, but actually they're very driven from what's going on inside themselves. And with that becomes the impact of that. Let me put, let me put uh, labels to this yeah. uh, language, common language. So two things are at play. The first one is confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is our need to be surrounded by like-minded people who would confirm to us that we are right that we are right. It's a grandiose defense. So if we think that a certain type of relationship is bad for you, if I think a type of relationship is bad for you, I want you to agree with me. If you disagree with me, you're challenging my grandiosity. It's uh, All my defenses are up and I become very aggressive. Is that challenging your grandiosity or is it challenging your sense of self in the fact that you as yourself can make the right choices and decisions? No, confirmation bias has to do with grandiosity and, and safety, sense of safety. So that's why people create echo chambers and thought silos on, on the internet, on social media. Because they want to be surrounded by, you know, all Trump supporters want to be surrounded by Trump supporters. They wouldn't welcome a progressive liberal who would challenge some of their assumptions. They would, you know, so it's the same here. Narcissists are bad. Victims of narcissists are all good. Splitting defense. And then if you disagree, you, you are challenging the, the world order. You're challenging order and structure. You're destabilizing the cosmos, not only the... So this is one thing. The second thing is, of course, the rescuer or savior mentality. People want to rescue and fix other people, fix their but lives. Themselves, but for themselves, not... I know the impact could be they might help someone, but it's about themselves, isn't it? Yes, rescuer and savior mentality is a grandiose defense. And so they want to rescue and fix other people's lives, rescue them from bad relationships. And, so. and they get extremely agitated and irritated and aggressive if you disagree to be saved. I mean, they will bump you on the head and save you. Um, and they, they will paralyze you and save you. So I am not saying, I, I coined the phrase narcissistic abuse and I invented the complex strategy of no contact. I was the first to suggest no contact, which is an interlinked set of 23 strategies. It's not as simple as it sounds. So but I'm the last simple. person. It's hard breaking that addiction, isn't it? It's a tough thing to do. I would be the last person to invalidate or dispute the experience of victimhood because I was the first to describe it. I am I'm entitled to say what I'm saying, as not many people are. And so I agree that there are groups of people who are victimized by narcissists. Narcissists victimize. That's what they do. This is their adaptive. The, the narcissist says, I'm going to be the abuser from now on. The hell with being a victim. Doesn't suit me. So there are real victims. However, we must understand two critical things. Victimhood is decided only by the victim. Yeah. We, if we try to take this away this decision making power away from the victim we are victimizing her correct we are correct. invalidating yeah. her we are infantilizing her yeah. we are doing to her what the narcissist is doing to her if we tell her are you crazy you shouldn't stay in this relationship we are abusing her correct i ah oh, i love this and i use an analogy of our nervous system with this like a ladder so if if you've got a victim who is already at the bottom of the ladder in a freeze response and you're saying just leave just go and they're already feeling weak not good enough anyway for staying potentially you're actually further abusing and gaslighting them and making yes, them actually you are. Feel even worse you are you're actually colluding correct. with her abusers interject even though the intention to them is coming from a good place because they just want to make either, you happy, so to speak. Either from, actually, from a good place, either from yeah. a good place or, or from a grandiose place. We're not quite sure. Correct. And uh, the and second thing, so this, is, so this is the first thing. Victimhood is defined exclusively yeah. by the victim. 
And the second thing is, there is no distinction, psychodynamic, analytical, clinical, there is no distinction between victims of complex trauma, narcissists, borderlines, and even psychopaths. There is no distinction that we can make as psychologists. So the only thing to focus on is not demonizing the other side or whatever, because you can end up demonizing yourself, actually. If you demonize a narcissist and then you gain some self-awareness, you suddenly discover that you had been acting narcissistically Correct. in the past few months. What then? Yeah. What then? So instead of all this mess, we should focus on survival tactics and strategies. Yeah. How to? Self-defense. Yeah. Self it almost becomes irrelevant. To... It's almost irrelevant about any label, so to speak. It's how do you feel? Yeah. Are you happy? Do you feel content? Do you feel like you're living the best version of your life? And if the answer is no, well, how do we change that? Does that mean you exit a relationship? Does that mean that, you know, where is that coming from? And let's work on that, you know? So I think what you highlight is a really great point. And, and it goes back to even the stuff we were talking about at the start, labels, we use labels and yes, they can be very validating for people as well. But the flip side of that, there's a whole host of others. Like you say, we, we demonize, we, you know, it, it becomes then about us and them, so to speak. But I do get when you're in, in that abusive relationship or coming out of all of that, and you're in that kind of real defense, you know, fight, flight and freeze. The last thing they want to do is almost feel sorry for the the abuser in some respects and, and I think that like you say it's almost comes in stages so to speak I think it's working on yourself initially having a little bit of understanding of the dynamic but the fact of really understanding just as we've been talking about here the dynamic of a narcissist I think um you know, if you have a conversation with someone who's coming out of a relationship with a narcissist and you start to talk about their, the narcissist trauma and their childhood, they're not going to want to hear that at that stage because that takes away their victim feelings, so to speak. And whilst it doesn't excuse it, it can give an explanation, but I don't think people are ready to hear that right at the start of a healing journey um, for them as well. But I think this is where hopefully, you know, people like you and I can educate around all of this. I mean, I know, you, you know, you're way more of an expert and been doing this far longer than I have um, as well. But I love the fact that, you know, you're coming from a place and this is where I totally believe in as well that, you know, it's good for understanding, but labels can be really detrimental in all of this too. And we've got to look beyond that in a society because we live in a world where there is so much judgment. There is so much assumption. If you don't agree with what I say, then you're wrong, I'm right. And then everybody's in this defense mode, even more at the moment with coronavirus, you can almost see everybody simmering away and wanting a reason to, to fight back and everything. And I think, you know, everything that you've spoken about today just highlights that we need more education around all of this. We need a, a, an understanding. It doesn't excuse, but it can help explain and give us an understanding. And that in itself can help people realize it's not your fault it's circumstance, it's childhood and everything else as well. And I think that's such an important point for people to realize. What worries me, well, first of all, I, I don't think the victim should feel sorry for the abuser. I'm all, all against this. Um, but the but victim many, do. many people come to me where they've been to, in counseling sessions, mm -hmm. they, they go to marriage counseling and they come out and they feel like the counselor, probably because they're ill-educated, um, again, not their fault, just society as a general with a counsellor in that situation, because they feel like they're trying to understand the narcissist behaviour and give, you know, reasons why. And it really invalidates the experience then of the other person who sat there and they come away feeling even worse. I think we should uh, we should disentangle a few a few of these concepts. Understanding the narcissist, where he comes from, his dynamics and so on, is not invalidating the victim's experience um invalidating the victim's experience is saying you're not a victim and the narcissist behavior is not abusive and you're wrong and you're crazy and something that's invalidating but understanding the the other side having a more nuanced per, uh, perception of reality 
avoiding labels, or demonizing at least, is helpful to the victim. Is helpful to the victim because she needs to, to understand her role, her contributions, definitely if she wants to avoid a similar situation in the future. She needs to understand uh, why the abuser behaved the way he had done because if the abuser is perceived as an impersonal natural disaster, something uh, that has, had just happened, it absorbs the victim from any role or contribution, and that's bad for the victim. And if the abuser is perceived as a malevolent demonic entity, then the abuser would tend to consider herself as a magnet, like the eternal victim and would be stuck in a victimhood stance for yeah. the rest of her life yeah. and would even elevate victimhood into a dimension of identity so uh, victimhood would become her identity that, sec that secondary gain in some respect yeah. from yes. perpetuating the, the victim we, these are pitfalls that abuse that victims should avoid it's it's the victim's interest to avoid these pitfalls they need to see the abuser for what he is a very deficient and problematic human being and it would allow them to transform their experience into a meaningful one because if you are subject to a natural disaster to a virus uh, then it's not a meaningful experience it has no meaning and if you're subject to a demon or a devil it equally has no meaning and if you're a magnet then you're totally passive yeah you're passive that's that is not conducive to mental health. No. And if victimhood becomes your identity, you will attract abusers endlessly Correct. because you will want to validate your position as a victim. This, this will have become your comfort zone. Yeah. So you would want to continue to be a victim. That becomes familiar to you. Familiar, the comfort zone, you know, the rules, etc. Plus it, it aggrandizes you. It, it, it makes you, you feel, you feel at home when you're a victim. So you would tend to attract abusers, really, because this is who you are. You're a victim. It's a passive thing. These are horrible, horrible pitfalls. These are horrible traps. And regrettably, I can say from monitoring online, the online situation, majority of victims online, because there are many victims offline, majority of victims online had already fallen into many of these traps. And many of them are in a hopeless situation, which has nothing to do with the abuser. The abuser is long gone. They are now perpetuating the abuse, self-perpetuating. But do you not think that when we when we think about the online is because people don't understand, because we've medicalized narcissistic personality disorder. So if someone almost uses the word narcissist and, you know, people, well, is there a diagnosis? How do you know that they are? that there's this feeling like that sometimes these victims of narcissistic abuse have to almost explain to other people then why they feel like that, because it's this word in our society that is so misunderstood. And really, it's like, a, like we say, it's a host of behavior traits, you know, that show up in lots of different elements of somebody's life, you know, but if you call someone a narcissist, because it's used so freely, so to speak, it's almost like because on the surface externally well when I look at your relationship with your other half or your mom or your father it looked like it was a really good relationship because obviously on the surface the narcissist would normally behave in a certain way publicly and then obviously behind closed doors it can it can be very different so how does that then how does say a victim say that they are involved with a narcissist or being a victim of narcissistic abuse do you think so that it doesn't feel like they're in being invalidated are we basically saying that anybody who feels they've been the victim of narcissistic abuse if they want to share their experience and again many don't and some do because they want to validate all of that are we saying don't use that word focus on yourself gain some education and understanding around all of that but many people obviously won't do that. And with this, then it almost and what comes up is almost like those people then who've been victims of narcissistic abuse. We've got online people saying they've been victims of narcissistic abuse and they haven't, which then almost pushes underground even more because they feel even worse. 
they're saying they've been in a narcissistic relationship. They're getting on with their life now. It looks like everything is okay. Why aren't I doing that? And it actually makes them feel even worse. It's almost, again, society is almost gaslighting them and invalidating their experience. You're weak. You can't cope. You're, you know, you aren't good enough because look, they were in that narcissistic relationship and they're fine now. If I'm saying I was, but I'm not, then I, maybe it's me. Maybe I'm weak. Maybe I'm helpless. And we've got this kind of juxtaposition then in our society then where the ultimate goal is we want everyone to try and live a happy and, and thriving life. So how do we, how do you think we resolve that? I think, Big question. <laughs> I think instead of saying I'm a victim, we should say I had been victimized. Yes. Oh, I love that. I did a training on this the other day. I said, we need to say you have been victimized by a narcissist they are the abuser and what you have is narcissistic trauma from the narcissistic abuse so you're victimized by the narcissist having narcissistic trauma by the narcissist who has abused you and victimized you yes and it, it's not who you are yeah. it's not what had happened to you is not who you are yes. what had happened to you if you take the right steps will never happen to you again it's not it pre you, preordained. Not because of you. It's not preordained. It's not inevitable. Yeah. You can learn how to not experience this again. Imagine how ridiculous it would be if I were mugged and I would henceforth define myself as a mugging victim. Yeah. I mean, yeah. everyone would think I'm nuts. Yeah. You know? I love that analogy. Mm. And many, many times when there is a power asymmetry in in relationships for example in coercive control when there's a power asymmetry yeah. victims tend to define their entire identity via the abuse so rape victims for example do go about for the rest of their lives defining themselves as rape victims when you ask such a woman when you interview such a woman she would say i'm a rape victim really you're also a professor of english you're also well traveled. You're also meter 70 tall. You also you also have brown eyes. What do you mean you're a rape victim? Yeah. Rape is an incident. It's not a determinant or dimension of your identity in any way, shape, or form. It had happened to you. Yeah. So again, we're back to the language element of all of this. We're back to the use of language and how really as a society we misuse language with our understanding so how do we get around that it's part of a much part of a much bigger trend victimhood and victimization have become bon ton they have become the new thing yeah it's like a badge of honor a fad. they're yeah. a fad they're a fashion mm -hmm. everyone is trying to find a victimhood niche you're a victim because of your sex why, is, why do you think that is? Do you think it's we're so starved of connection in our world today? It's almost like, where can I gain connection, so to speak? Ah, oh, this is how I'm going to gain connection. Because then they feel part of something. It validates them being part of something bigger. Because we are so isolated I think, now. I think belonging and acceptance have something to do with it, of course. Mm -hmm. But it raises the question, why, why would you choose to belong um, to a victimhood club? Why not belong to a superior club? Mm. Um, and so but again isn't that isn't the use of that word belonging to a victimhood isn't that the choice of our language with that isn't it a, a kind of a hope club in that it's validating you're not the only one no these people don't want to exit the victimhood they're emotionally invested in their victimhood they perpetuate it they idolize it they glamorize it it's glamorous they make a lot of money off it they create social networks within the victimhood movement. It fulfills, it is like a drug addiction. Drug addiction has nothing to do with the drug. No, The, the drug fulfills no, social functions. Yeah. The drug fulfills psychological functions. Yeah, I agree. The drug has numerous functions. That's why it's so difficult to get rid of a, of a drug habit. Right. Because it doesn't only really cater to your synapses. <laughs> yeah. it, for example, drug, drug users, they get in, involved and enmeshed in social networks of other drug users. So... Victimhood had become the new drug of choice, the new fashion and the new fad. fad. Now, there are victims of narcissistic abuse. There are minorities which are victims. Sexual orientations are victims. Everyone is... A, the, the, the European Union defines itself as a victim of the vaccine manufacturers. Yeah. 
victimhood is the new language. If you want to drive your point across, if you want to, to then to communicate, you must present some victimhood stance. Some you must choose some victimhood niche. Now the European Union is the largest economy on earth, mm -hmm. and yet if you listen to the leaders of the European Union, they present themselves as victims of unscru unscrupulous, avaricious vaccine manufacturers in the United States. Victims. Mm. They don't say we can demolish these vaccine manufacturers in a jiffy if we want to, because they were the greatest economic power on earth. No, they're victims. Britain uh, adopted the victimhood stance in Brexit. Big, big, Britain was a victim of the European Union. Everyone is a victim. And so, of course, real victims of narcissistic abuse would feel good in such an ambience, such an environment, and would have no incentive to exit the victimhood position. So do you think, do you not think that is a sweeping statement of everybody, that everybody then who becomes a victim of narcissistic abuse almost wants to wear that as a badge of honour for the rest of their life? No, not everyone. Not everyone. Yeah. Not everyone. I, I, I was just going to say, because I find that, I, I get, and again, this goes on the journey in some respects, that initially, of course, being around other people, because you suddenly realise, hey, this isn't just me. This didn't just happen to me in this world because of me. And it starts to open people's eyes to recognise it is about them, not them as the victim, so to speak, that there are reasons why because surely then if this happens to other people in yes, different ways, but sort of, you know, similarities, then that surely must mean then it isn't about me. And we, and that starts this process then of understanding from themselves and also from the narcissist so that they can move beyond all of that too. You know, I just, for me, I just see it as part of a process, so to speak, but I think it needs for some, to be, for some people, it needs to be made people, more aware. I think we need more for some people. It's a part of for some yeah, people. It's a part of the process. I do, but you can. But the majority of yeah. victims yeah. online have been online for four years or six years. Yeah. People brag that they've, they've been watching narcissism videos for six years. But again, do you not feel like that? That is a judgment of them, of that they are. I am judging them. Yeah. It's bad, pathological. Correct. It's grandiose, it's narcissistic to remain a victim for life and to be proud yeah. of it. And I agree with you on that. Of but, course I'm judging them. <laughs> but again, from a judgment perspective, is that actually, if we're judging somebody else, does that not say more about us and the person themselves? Because if we want to help them without judgment and actually support them in this to maybe get them out of that victimhood mentality so to speak is no, is, is us judging them conducive to the environment for no, them no 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 I'm, I'm not judging them in the sense that i i am trying to impose my values or my worldview yeah. or my preferences as concerning mental health on, on them yeah. if they're happy in this environment yeah. and if it allows them to be functional yeah. then as we had said before good for them but I still, I still have a mind, and I still am allowed to express an opinion. I still can say that a codependent narcissist relationship is sick. It stunts growth. It's a problem. It's problematic. It's, I can say this. I, what I cannot do is enforce this view on the codependent and the narcissist. I, I can say that people who are perpetual professional victims who were their victimhood as a badge of honor or on their sleeve, who elevate their victimhood into a self-aggrandizing statement, claiming that they are angels, blameless, flawless, et cetera, et cetera, who refuse to countenance their contribution or role in what had I happened agree. to them. I, I can still say this is dysfunctional, yeah. this is unhealthy, this is narcissistic, yeah. and so on. I'm not the only one who is saying this. In October last year, there was a study published by Gabay, G-A-B-A-Y, and others about the construct of, of uh, they called it the TIV, TIV uh, construct, the tendency for interpersonal victimhood. They discovered a psychological construct among people which predisposes them to play the eternal victim. Mm -hmm. Now, Karpman, in his drama triangle, 
there's always a victim, a rescuer, and an abuser. Yeah. And what Cartman had discovered, he revel I mean, unambiguously, is that victims often become abusers. Abusers become rescuers, rescuers become victims. This is a total truth. That's why it's called the drama triangle, because each participant takes different roles at different times. So there's a lot more to victimhood than meets the eye. Yeah, I agree with you. And, and when I see, for example, the self-styled empaths online, mm. my skin crawls. <laughs> these, are, these are people who had discovered their claim on fame. They had discovered a reason to live. They are they they revel in their victimhood. They cherish it. They nurture it. They have competitions. Who is more victim than the other? Whose abuser was more abuser than the others? I do I mean, see that. Totally sick, that. Yeah. sick scenery. The yeah. scene there is sick to the core. These are sick people. My suspicion: covert narcissists. I can't diagnose them, of course, from afar, but they strike me as covert narcissists. And trust me, I know a thing or two about covert narcissists. So this is what I'm railing against, that, there, that narcissists victimize people. I'm the first to have said it, that the narcissistic abuse is the most horrendous conceivable type of abuse. I'm the first to have said it, that there are numerous real victims who want to not be victims anymore no question about it, that we should help them, of course. Should we collaborate with people whose victimhood is a dimension of their identity, the cause for pride, a vehicle for celebrity? Um, no. A, a power play? No. Because these people had, had converted from victims to narcissists. And that's not some Wagner who is saying this. This is Judith Herman, the Judith Herman. Not Pete Walker with his misrendition of CPTSD, but Judith Herman, the real, the real McCoy. So it's time that we speak up. We are terrified by these people because they are numerous and because they are aggressive. Do you not think then, with everything you are saying, and again, we go back to the medicalization, the DSM, whether it be codependent, narcissist, borderline, empath, any of those things, that really what we should always be looking at is root cause. It starts with you as the self. And then we look at that understanding then of the dynamics then of that relationship. And if you're happy, great, carry on, so to speak, as long as obviously, you know, that there, there's a duty of care if there's danger, so to speak, involved. Um, but other than that, do you think we need more education then around people recognizing the sense of self of, of what, you know, like you say, being happy, creating those boundaries, recognizing that regardless of what somebody is as a label, so to speak, it's all irrelevant. It's all irrelevant. It's actually about but there's a you. Barrier, but there's a barrier to this education. Mm. The investment in victimhood is a defining dimension of identity is a barrier to education. But do you not think they, then, what's the root cause then of that victimhood? Where does that come from? Because when I think, and I, and I totally agree with the majority of what you're saying, it's almost like, but if that person then is sitting in that victimhood mentality, why? Why are they doing that? Where's that coming from? They don't want to find out why. Correct. It, it threatens their... But there will be some that do. And I get, just like a narcissist, just like somebody else, you can't help someone who doesn't recognize that there's a situation that they need to be helped from. You, you can only help someone if they say, hey, you know, something isn't right. I'm not happy. I need some support with all of Even it. more basic, you can't help someone, even more basic, you can't help someone who refuses to become self-aware or to introspect. Yeah. He, someone can disagree with you whether the situation requires help. Someone can tell you, no, my situation is perfect, I'm happy. But if she, she or he refuse to learn, refuse to become self-aware, refuse to introspect because it threatens their emotional investment in something. You see, narcissists are the same. They refuse to become self-aware and so on because if, if a narcissist really looks at himself in the mirror, it's a pathetic figure. It's a dysfunctional, pathetic child. And this is the process of mortification, which narcissists try to avoid at any cost. 
Mortification is becoming introspective, becoming self-aware. The same with, with these invested victims. They don't want to hear the latest studies. On my channel, for example, I always, I always rely on the latest studies, the cutting edge studies. They're furious. They're absolutely furious when they hear that Judith Herman thinks that victims of CPTSD are actually narcissists and psychopaths, or that borderline is a form of secondary psychopathy. Or they, I mean, they go crazy. They go apeshit. But they, do you know, they... I think that's because we've we've put so much to these labels because we see them as bad, and they don't want. No one wants to see themselves as bad, so to speak. And again, if we're looking down to the root cause of it, rather than labeling, and because these words so hold, hold so much weight. No, not even that. Okay, I'm sorry, I gave the wrong examples. They are not interested to learn, for example, what what role they have, yeah. what contributions Correct. they make. Ownership made. and responsibility. Yeah, they refuse. Yeah. They absolutely refuse. It's adamant, it's aggressive, it's violent, and it's vile. But isn't that then, when we look at the narcissist on exactly the same level, the ownership and responsibility, and we look at, you know, if we're coming, and I try and do this, you know, I try and look at things from a place of compassion, because I know if I'm not getting curious and being compassionate about a situation, I'm not as myself, there's, I'm bringing other past stuff into the equation of what I am saying, you know, it's past experiences that are showing up, so that if we can try and obviously, who knows when this would ever happen in our world, so to speak. But if we can try and look at everybody with compassion, but curiosity as well to gain understanding, doesn't mean excuses behavior, but to gain explanation. But it just seems like, again, that our society is filled with judgment, um, lack of compassion, you know, words hold so much weight, there is no ownership and responsibility, so to speak which is okay if that's how people want to be at the end of the day. But then how do we move forward then in a space where those that do want to be helped, that do want to take ownership, that do want to take responsibility, they do recognize things aren't right. How can we support them better? Because I know well, I'm, we can, I'm we a long time, I'm conscious of time for you. We can help them to uh, get to know themselves. Yeah. We can then provide them with tools to develop boundaries. Yeah. We can then teach them strategies of self-defense, survival if they choose to, coping. We can focus on, on practicalities. There's a problem with tribalism. Yeah. There's a problem with atomization. The social fabric has been rendered apart. There's no social consensus anymore. It's everyone to his own and everyone um, pulls together in tribes. And the tribes, there's a lot of hostility between the tribes. It's in politics, it's in politics, it's in science, it's everywhere. It's not only in this space of narcissists versus victims. It's always someone versus something, someone. The versus thing is, you know, so a victim who really try, wants to get on with her life, live a better, healthier life, accomplish perhaps different outcomes, be more self-efficacious, there are numerous tools in psychology to help her. This is not new. This has been going on for decades. We have no problem to teach someone how to be self-efficacious, how to develop a sense of agency, how to own her role and contributions in her relationships, how to design her relationships to work, how to exit dysfunctional relationships and how to identify them, how to fend off abuse, even this, what tactics, I mean, it's all there. It's a rich treasure. But, but people are far less focused on self-transformation, self-awareness and introspection and betterment and evolution and personal development and growth. They're far less focused on this than they have been in the times of Abraham Maslow, for example. There has been a shift from self-improvement, self-help, which was the big rage in yeah. the 80s and the 90s, there's been a shift from this to victimhood and tribalism. This is a societal trend. Yeah. The poor victims of abuse, narcissistic abuse, they're not an isolated incident. It's not that something is wrong with them. We are all the same. Even I, when I look at myself, I belong to tribes. Definitely. For example, I am super rational and I detest religion religious people and their infantile projections of gods and angels and I don't know what. 
and I'm very aggressive about it. And I bad mouth them and I shout at them and I and I would decapitate them if I could, like ISIS, you know. So this is my tribalism. I react allergically to religious people. I think they're stupid. I think they're vitals. This is my tribalism. Everyone belongs to a tribe. Again, and I do, do feel that see, I'm victim. But do you not then see, even with what you're saying there, from that judgment perspective, because of your past experiences, what you feel in that moment is being projected onto them. Like you say, you know, I have this, you know, hatred of religion, etc. And, you know, I agree, I'm not a religious person, but equally, I wouldn't necessarily get into a debate. I'd happily debate it, but it certainly wouldn't bring up in me that need to show them how wrong they are, because that would then mean I am right. And not even necessarily in the right wrong status of all of that. It's, you know, it's almost like in a society, why does someone have to believe and feel and think what I think? Well, just a second, I'm running out of battery. Oh, okay I, then. I Wake yourself then. <laughs> I know. So I, I will let you go in a moment. <laughs> it's just such a fascinating discussion uh, and everything. And I know everyone will really, really enjoy listening to all of this because it's so real. It's so important um, to talk Thank about you. all of this. Hmm. Just. Is up. <laughs> I know. I know. Is up. It's not about it's not about uh, who's right and who's wrong. Uh, who's right and who's wrong is a legitimate discourse. Why do you? So why do it, you? It's about power. Need, it's yeah. about power and aggression. Okay. So why do you feel the need then, say from a religious perspective, to get them to know how stupid they are? Because modern, modern, modern civilization, modern existence, the postmodern condition fosters a lot of aggression, and does not provide legitimate venues for discharging this aggression. In the past, we provided legitimate venues for discharging aggression, but political correctness and numerous other developments blocked all the venues to the discharge of aggression. And so we now discharge aggression and we engage in power plays with everyone all the time. Does that make it right? Up. Sorry? Does that make it right? So when, so when we talk about that power no, it's not play, right. You ask me what's happening. That's what's happening. <laughs> That's what's happening. I don't know if it's right or wrong. But this is the situation. Now, of course, victims engage in aggression against narcissists. Narcissists engage in aggression against victims. I engage in aggression against religious people. It's, it's all aggression-based. It's a power play. It's a very... And so it, it, it excludes meaningful conversation. It excludes transformation. It definitely excludes self-awareness and introspection. And these are the tools of psychology. The tools of talk therapy are insight, which is introspection and self-awareness, conversation, talking. All these are excluded. Therapies, therapies are becoming less and less and less efficacious. I agree with you. I, 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 I agree. You know, I do a lot of somatic work in what I do. And, and again, from the cognitive perspective, you can say you're good enough till you're blue in the face, but it's not necessarily going to change what you feel um, in all of that. You know, you have to work on that, on that element. And I think, like you say, from a talking therapy perspective, of course, it has a place because you've got someone listening to you, validating your experiences. But is it actually going to get to the root cause of all of that um, as well? And I think, you know, just everything you've highlighted, Sam, I think it's it's just down to more education and 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 almost live and let live if that's what how people want to be if that's what they want to behave like but creating platforms i hope like i do like you like you do that people can realize that it doesn't have to necessarily be like that it this is about you and there is an opportunity for you to learn and grow and live you know the best life you can possibly do and if people want to sit in the tribes and the victimhoods and everything else, then that's okay. I think this, the sad part for me in all of this is thinking that if people are sitting in that victimhood mentality, so to speak, why are they doing that? What has led them to feel that and accept in some respects that that's good enough for them to live their life like that? And that's what I find sad in all of this, that 
the people who do and they, they and they do absolutely they say sitting in victimhood for the rest of their life and there's that element for me where I think wow they think that that life they're living and again that's me almost assuming that they're living less of a life because they're sat like that that they feel like their life is only worthy of that because there is so much more out there for us to live enjoy you know connect talk to other people and i just think, I think if you grow up if you grow up if you grow up being noticed only when you when you're a victim yeah. if you if you have utility to your parents only when you're a victim yeah. if you're told that you're unworthy your self-esteem is low, your sense of self-worth is fluctuating or non-existent, then you would tend to gravitate naturally to, to a state of victimhood because that's your comfort zone. And you know that as a victim, you're going to get attention, you're going to get compassion, Correct. you're going to get love, yeah. you're going to get support and succor. Correct. Covert narcissism right there. In so victimhood victimhood yeah. guarantees favorable outcomes from the environment which you believe wrongly, always wrongly, that you cannot get any other way. Right. Maybe I'm not worthy of love, but I'm very worthy as a victim. Yeah. So you know, don't, yeah, don't love me as who I am. Correct. Don't love me as who I am. Love, love, love me as, uh, as what had happened to me. Yeah. Love me because of what had happened to me. Don't love me as who I am. Correct. Because that's their version of love. That's their blueprint of actually what love yeah. is. You yeah. know, they don't realize love isn't necessarily a healthy love here is like that That's and again we have time. again we have a confluence between narcissist and victim yeah. the narcissist had learned as a child that he he can be loved only when and if he performs yeah conditional mm -hmm. and the victim had learned that she can be loved only if and when she performs as a victim correct both of them are performance based both of them believe that love is conditional so both, in some respects, are codependents. They're both lacking in yes. themselves, correct? Yes, absolutely. Narcissism is a form of codependency. Extreme yeah. form, actually, yeah. of codependency. Yeah. The narcissist depends for his life correct. on other people yeah. and their input. He has no internal environment. Everything comes from outside. It's... Uh, you, begin, you, begin, you, you see the similarities, the amazing absolutely. similarities between absolutely. victims and narcissists. The, the starting point, absolutely, um, in all of this. So I'm conscious been conditioned of the same. here. So I suppose in, in, in Roundup then, if you had to give, because I'm thinking of myself here, okay, I'm going to be a bit selfish at the end here now, okay? So me being in the space I am online and everything else, what would you say to me are the top three things you'd like to see more of from those in my space as well online what would you like to see more of how so if you were going to if you were my business coach so to speak to create change to create impact to create you know this sense of maybe more understanding okay what would you say is the top three things you would like to see more of in that online space number one love yourself yeah don't love don't love love yeah don't be in love with love yeah. don't love mm -hmm. don't love yourself because others tell you that you're lovable or because others love you yeah. love yourself never mind regardless of what other people say or do and love yourself regardless regardless of whether you have other people in your life at all I love that. That analogy of being loved as opposed to being lovable. You are lovable regardless. But if you're in a room of 100 people, they're not all going to love you. Doesn't mean you're not lovable. It just means yeah. they don't love you. Should not you. Be, you should not. Your sense of self-love should not be derivative. It should not be an outcome of other people's judgments or gaze or whatever. It's it should so be totally independent and should be. And you should proceed even in the absence of other people. Yeah. Now, many, many people are in love with the idea of being in love. Yeah. They, they, so they are infatuated with infatuation. Right. And that's an unhealthy state. The second piece of advice, if you have the slightest inkling of a shadow, of a possibility that something is wrong, walk away. If you don't like the way he raises the fork to his mouth on the first date, walk away. So any the, red flag, any red anything, flag. Even something that looks totally irrelevant. Yeah. 
I don't know, he was talking to the waiter in the restaurant and he wasn't looking at him. Yeah. You didn't like it. Walk away. Do not, do not reframe or speculate or mitigate or oh, don't that's argue. A hard, that's a hard thing to do, isn't it? it really do not is. argue with yourself and do not let your loneliness dictate your future state of victimhood. Uh, but that, that, I love that. Do not let your loneliness dictate your future state. So, because the yeah, antecedent, of, right. antecedent of victimhood is loneliness. Mm. So if something strikes you as wrong, it is wrong. Trust your gut a thousand percent, not a hundred percent, a thousand percent. We have more neurons be... there, don't we? You know, our gut, we have more information going from our gut to our Much brain more. than our brain to our Much gut. More. Actually, if you're interested in the numbers, for every million bits of information that we ignore, we process 55. Yeah. Wow. Million bits of information do go in. But we don't. We are not aware of it. Oh, Sam, I've ignored millions and millions. Over right. Years. Why trust the fifty-five? <laughs> Why trust the fifty-five and not the million? Absolutely. Yeah. Your brain is telling you something. You don't like something. Yeah. I mean, you go. You you get up to go to the toilet, and he kind of looks away shiftily. Yeah. Walk away. Trust your gut. One hundred million percent. Yeah. The last advice. You confine me to three. So. <laughs> the last not joking. The last bit of observation or advice I, I would give. It is extremely tempting to abuse your abuser. Mm. Don't. Yeah. Don't. It's a path of no return. This is the real abuse. If you abuse your abuser, your abuser will have succeeded to convert you into a clone, into a clone of himself, which is what he had wanted all along. He had wanted you to disappear and reappear as his copy. If you abuse your abuser, you will have become his copy. Don't give him what he wants. This is precisely what he wants. Yeah, maintain your you maintain your core, maintain your values. I love that. Maintain love, who you are. And I think again, you know, all of these are so much harder to put into practice in real life because yes. people do want to get back at their abuser and and everything and fight as such um because again i think it goes back to in some tiny element they think they're going to have this epiphany because as a society we like to think there's good in everybody so to speak so you know maybe if i say this they revert almost being that toddler what behavior can i do to get you to recognize all of this and turn into the nice person so to speak um and all of that but yeah i totally agree you're giving your energy to someone where they're not going to change. That's who they are. You need to put that energy into yourself. And I think that's such an important point. It really is because sadly, again, many people do that. They get hooked into these back and forth, which is why no contact is so important as well. You know, you get back in those endless messages and emails back and yeah. forth. Yeah. You're actually feeding what the narcissist wants you to do. Yeah. And that. Well, thank true. you. I've absolutely, I mean, oh my goodness, I could sit and talk to you all day about it. I Thank love, you. I love how you bring the whole sort of science element into this, but in a really understandable way, actually, I think, you know, that that's really important, I think. Well, I'm a, I'm a teacher. Correct. <laughs> and, teacher. and it totally comes across as well, Sam, because you're putting it in a context of real depth and knowledge, but in a, in a way people can understand. Thank and you. I just hope, you know, anyone who listens to this, just bring a bit more compassion into how they behave and and you know whether they are the victim or victimized by the narcissist or indeed the narcissist or anything that there is that element of you know and i hope that came across with both of us here of this understanding of all of this of this not blaming anybody not kind of you know no, of labeling but really trying to gain some insight and understanding really into the root cause of all of this and maybe what we can we can all do better in this world to try and help with all of that as well so any final words that you want to say before before we end no it's been a it's been a pleasure and um Let's see if people ask questions and so on. We may do some follow-up. Yeah, I, I would absolutely love that. I really love that. You know, I've got a, a, a big community of people that I know they might even watch that and they will feel triggered by some of the stuff we've been speaking about. But you know what? Bring awareness to that and, you know, let, let's see what else comes up down the line. So thank you so much, Sam. Thank, thank you, you for, having for me. your time today. And, and I look Take forward care. to speaking to you soon. Take care. You too. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you.